Okay, well, we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the monthly behavior support rounds for um, Behavior Supports Ontario. I want to welcome everyone um, and just remind everyone this is monthly, usually the third Thursday of every month from two to three. My name is Jordan Holland. I'm the program director for behavior supports for the Toronto Central Region, uh, but hosted here at Baycrest. Um, today, we have an amazing speaker, which I will introduce, Tracy Human, um, who is amazing. Um, she's going to be here to talk about pain care and the intersection with behavioral care. Um, but let me do some housekeeping first. So first of all, I, we wanted to do acknowledgement um, that although we are meeting virtually, uh, we acknowledge that Baycrest and our related uh, Toronto Central Behavior Support Programs operate on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, um, which have cared for the land for thousands of years. And we recognize the current treaty holders um, uh, and this let, that this land remains home to many of the diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and is sub subject to the dish and one spoon um, and an agreement of the peaceably sharing and caring of the Great Lakes region. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land today, and you may live and work in different areas and territories, so we encourage you to reflect on the land that, in which you live and consider your relationship to the land and to the people who are the traditional keepers of the land. I wanted to also say that these particular rounds um, are in partnership with the Ontario Centers for Learning, Research and Innovation, as well as the Behavior Supports for Seniors program and the Toronto Central, previously um, the Local Health Integration Network, now Ontario Health Toronto. So with that, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the housekeeping. Everyone, um, your microphone will be muted automatically. This event is being recorded and will be posted on the BSO website as well as the CLRI website. If you have questions, uh, we really encourage questions, please type them into the chat box or the Q&A section. We will have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation where we will uh, review all of the questions that have been posed um, and, and you'll have a chance to, to, to have any discussions. Um, if you have any technical problems, we have our amazing telehealth coordinator, Agnes. You can also type that into the chat box or reach out to Agnes directly and she will help you. Uh, and lastly, if you're interested in a certificate of attendance, at the end of this presentation, you'll be emailed um, with an evaluation. Please complete the evaluation, put your uh, contact information <laughs> me in it, and we will generate a certificate of attendance for you. Uh, excuse me. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce this, <laughs> excuse me, the speaker today. I don't know. Of course, I'm having trouble. Uh, Tracy Human, uh, who is a wonderful um, specialist in terms of pain management. She's a nurse by training. She's the director at the Palliative Pain and Symptom Management Consultation, <laughs> excuse me, program, um, which is the Toronto Service and it and also <laughs> linked with the Dorothy Lay Hospice. And with that, I think I better turn it over to you, Tracy, because I, I might expire before uh, before we can. <laughs> Oh, no. Aspiration risk. Aspiration risk. Thank you, Jordan. I'm just going to take a minute here and share my screen with you. And we'll get started. So thank you very much for inviting me to spend some time with you today. Um, Thumbs up for people that you can actually see my opening slide. Uh, Jordan and Agnes will monitor that for me and let me know if uh, there's any problems there. We're talking about pain care intersection with behavioral care. I want to try and take it to a different um, sort of uh, learning for you, perhaps so much. Uh, uh, from what perhaps you've had before. Um, so uh, yes, my name is Tracy Human, and um, I am not here today through any grants or research support. Um, I have been subcontracted and paid as a courseware developer with Pallium Canada. Um, from an advisory council kind of standpoint, uh, I was on the clinical advisory council for the Ontario Palliative Care Network for the past three years. Um, and uh, my program is funded through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So I do not get um, separate 
consulting fees. Um, uh, this program does not receive financial support other than the support of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, this program does not receive in-kind support and there are no contrast to be disclosed. Mitigating potential bias, the information that I'm presenting today uh, from this program is based on recent ev evidence, uh, informed information that explicitly um, from the Behavioral Support Rounds program. Uh, it is material, um, that the material is peer reviewed and all recommendations involving clinical medicine are based on evidence that is accepted within the profession and all scientific research referred to, reported or used in the BSR activity in support or justification of patient care recommendation conforms to the generally accepted standards. So I think that most of us um, here today um, are aware that there are many causes for behaviors um, and whether they're dementias, Alzheimer's proper, psychosis, personality disorders, substance use, um, with oop, substance use, withdrawal. Um, in fact, all emotions cause behaviors, all symptoms cause behaviors. Um, attempting to communicate when we're not understood, <clears throat> if we speak uh, a different language, or if we have cognitive or communication um, uh, challenges. <clears throat> so with that in mind, <clears throat> I think I caught what uh, Jordan had. Let me just take a quick sip. <laughs> I'm hoping that after our time together, you'll be able to describe the pain behavior link, maybe with a little bit more richness, uh, uh, or perhaps some new learning on top of the knowledge and expertise that you already have and be able to perhaps refresh the significance of pain care uh, to successful behavioral care. So let's talk a little bit about the pain behavior link. Uh, we all know that pain causes behaviors and we only need to reflect on our own personal experience, never mind our professional experience with pain, um, whether we have had an experience with acute pain or are living with chronic or persistent pain. Today, I thought I'd go through a little bit more than that. I think I would take us down a pathophysiology link between pain and behavior so that you'll see how the, intricately they're intertwined um, and therefore perhaps attach some renewed vigor to making it a part of a successful behavioral care plan. We are hardwired to elicit behaviors when pain is experienced. Regardless if we're consciously or unconsciously aware that nervous system is intact and is processing that information and responding to it. So whether we have an ability to perceive at whatever level that might be, um, our brain and our nervous system is telling us that what we're feeling is a pain signal um, and differentiating that from say emotional um, stimuli, other stimuli that there's this huge concert in our body that's constantly being conducted through our nervous system or any other a bodily message, um, even listening to music. So when we're talking about a pain response, um, it is actually driven, including the behaviors from the autonomic nervous system. So when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, it has three distinct branches, sympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric. It includes processes of managing our heart rate, our blood pressure, our respiration, digestion, sexual arousal, amongst a numerous of other things. I'm not gonna take us down the three distinct levels and how that communication happens within this matrix, but just put a pin in the fact that the behaviors related to a pain response are driven by the autonomic nervous system. So what that means is the person doesn't think about it. So in the presence of pain, behaviors should be expected. 
there's a little fancy schematic that I'm uh, going to walk you through here. Um, and so at the bottom left, you'll see uh, noxious stimuli. So the square with, with the noxious stimuli. So when we're talking about pain, it's an incredibly complex biopsychosocial phenomenon. There's, there's so much more that, that we don't know. And so what I'm bringing to you today is, is a current and emerging evidence. But we all know it's our warning system that something is wrong. It's warning us, our pain system is warning us of tissue damage that is occurring at the time that the pain is experienced or potential tissue damage. And so what would that be? Well, uh, ischemia, the tissue damage is happening right now. Potential, angina. If we don't do something to open up those blood vessels, you're going to go into an MI and protect, potentially uh, arrest. Those are, you know, the big red flag kinds of things. But um, ultimately, our pain pathway is warning us and communicating that the body is under threat that it's at risk of being damaged. And so some of the typical things that it's going to do here is it's going to tell us that we have, I want to do this for you, um, noxious stimuli. So the whole pain pathway starts at the site of injury, whether that's externally produced as we know from mechanical crushing, um, uh, bloating, uh, touch, thermal heat or cold chemical, uh, uh, all of these kinds of sig signals that, uh, that are transmitted are our noxious stimuli. And there's a plethora of them that we all know quite well. That noxious stimulus then starts our pain pathway or the pain um, responding loop, or in some areas you'll hear it referred to as the pain neural matrix, which is predominantly what's happening centrally in the brain. From that site of injury, certain nerves in our peripheral nerve system called nociceptors are going to carry that signal. And so we're on the move, the pain signal from the site of injury along the peripheral nervous system through nociceptive nerve fibers. And there's two kinds, A delta and C. A delta is a fast carrying um, and a C is a little bit slower carrying um, of the signal. The combination of both is what you'll often see when we're talking about chronic persistent pain, where we will get some of these responsive behaviors um, that you're working with. From there, it goes to the spinal cord, um, and that is an actual transmission to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, where there's a release of other uh, chemicals that will drive receptors to then carry that up the spinal thalamic transmission track to here, where we have the thalamocortical relays. Here is the brain of the engine, and that's what we call the neural matrix. It's actually happening in the anterior uh, cortex cingula, the insula, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, hypothalamus, and cerebral cortex. It's, they're all communicating and chattering back and forth to each other. And as soon as that happens, for simplicity's sake, it says, no, that's not music, and you're not, you're not inappropriately frightened, the body is under threat and that's a pain signal. And so it's going to trigger our autonomic reactivity, our autonomic nerve system. We're under threat, we're in fight or flight. We have to fight for our life or we have to protect our life. Um, and so these are all happening at the same time. Well, what happens within this central brain area here is the cortical limbic striatal circuits are going to draw attention to where it hurts. From there's the cognitive appraisal. 
How bad does it hurt? Where does it hurt, right? The reactional emotion of, oh, that's a little bit sore. Oh, and now it's gone. Or, oh, that's really sore. Or, oh my gosh, this is absolutely intolerable. I'm double, doubled over in pain. Or, oh my gosh, this pain is flooding and it's so horrific. Please do not touch me. Please do not put me in the shower because the water hurts. Please do not turn me. Please don't even approach me because as soon as I see you approaching me, the pain loop starts. And it's literally uh, starting to move even before you're... Oh, Tracy, I and then what do we get? We get to be so incredibly fast. Pardon? Oh, that's okay. You caught up. You you pause just for a moment. Maybe um... it's connection. Yes. Okay, great. So this is all happening so incredibly fast uh, that it's micro milliseconds, and I'm going to show you some of that. So ultimately, what's the takeaway from this, that it's autonomically driven and it needs to be because the body's under threat. That's the whole point of a pain signal. <clears throat> this is a little picture. It's a dizzying display of what's happening at the brain level. And you can see each one of those pathways has, a, has an arrowhead on each end. And so it's this constant back and forth rapid display that's bringing it in the sensory discriminative aspect, the affective, the emotion, the associative, and then driving that pain behavior. Well, how fast does this happen when I said micro milliseconds? Um, when we talk about the typical pain nerve fibers and the, the nociceptive fibers that I mentioned earlier, the a delta and the C fibers. What we're what we're seeing here is the uh, conduction speed, and so the A delta fibers here in the last column uh, that is five to forty um, milliseconds, and that it it. That's the velocity, the speed at which it transmits those signals when it's mechanical or thermal pain. Um, now, milliseconds, there are a thousand milliseconds in one second. So we begin to appreciate how rapidly this happened. Below that is the C fiber, the slower carrying nociceptive pain fiber. And that conduction speed is 0 0.5 to two milliseconds. So in reality, the peripheral nervous system carries signals at a particular velocity, a speed, you know, a velocity, the spinal cord at a certain velocity, and then the brain in all of this transmission stuff that I talked about in um, the previous slide. Uh, and now marry that with what we see above there, proprioception and touch nerve fibers. And you see the rapidity there of, of that transmission. So when moving hurts, when spatial orientation and turning of the head hurts or joints hurt, or we touch them and they hurt and we get a responsive behavior, that is even quicker. So when we tie the whole picture together, the response time is about of that pain from the time that the signal starts at the site of injury, up the spinal cord to the brain and down the descending pathways it averages about 10 milliseconds. 10 milliseconds, you're gonna get the behavior. Boom, like that. Um, and so when we think about that, someone doesn't have an opportunity to even think about how they're going to respond in the presence of pain with good reason, because it's a warning signal that something is wrong. In this picture, it just kind of pulls together the whole um, mechanism. We have the site of injury here. And in this example, it's showing a cut. 
signals are being transduced from the cut. And now we're on the move and we're going to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. In this instance, is showing the arms because they connect at the C-spine. If it was thorax, uh, thoracic or abnabin, it would be in the T-spine and of course um, organs as well. And then with our legs, et cetera, it'd be coming up to the lumbar spine, traveling up the spine to the brain where we go through all the thalamus, or, you know, limbic system uh, um, and amygdala <laughs> uh, and our sensory cortex. Yep, that's pain, downward modulation. Um, to tell us what we're going to do about it and how we're going to react to it and how big that reaction is going to be. The thing about the descending pathway here is the descending pathway back that tells grab grab where the cut is, you know, that response of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, I cut myself and we hold the area of injury. Um, that descending pathway attempts to modulate the pain signal and it re will release endorphins, right? Of which, you know, our endogenous opioids get released to do some pain management. In chronicity-based pain, the body can't make enough of that. And so that's part of what we do when we're doing pain management. But it can also amplify a pain signal. And particularly when pain becomes a disease in its own right. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. So here we go. We have um, a pain signal. Now, in research, they tend to measure a pain signal um, that is simulated in a lab. So they will either do um, a clamping pinch on someone's finger or a needle poke, that sort of thing. And it's one pain stimulus. But the people that, that you're involved in don't have one pain stimulus. <laughs> they have every pain stimulus that can be imagined. They have multiple chronic illnesses, multiple chronic progressive illnesses. In fact, I see on average three um, chronic conditions, three chronic progressive conditions mixed in there, um, and a couple of them that are, are in fact life life limiting all of those are going to be producing pain signals the body's under threat there's literal tissue damage happening <clears throat> so it's not just a pain signal it's a forest fire of signals that are flooding into the brain telling you you must behave you must move to action you must get relief you must get help and that flooding of, of the central nervous system, driving that attention, that cognitive appraisal, emotion, reaction, behavior flashes over. And we get flashover that is overwhelming. What's the link then? Flashover is going to give you the behaviors. The behaviors that challenge. All pain is going to drive a behavior. But the behaviors that challenge where you're looking to do um, a behavioral care plan in people with pain, we've got flashover pain. And so, um, well, how many of these individuals will be uh, experiencing in their every waking moment flashover pain? Well, let's have a little look here. What we know by research is 83%, and I'll use long-term care as an example of the population. Um, this is no way blaming long-term care. I love, love long-term care people. They're the most dedicated, conscientious, hardworking people I know, um, next to BSO people. <laughs> I love working with BSO. So um, in, an, in that demographic of our elderly, with all of those multi-driven sources of pain uh, from multiple pain sites, we know that 83% of them have pain that's not optimally managed or hasn't been identified. Um, 
with our nonverbal or cognitively impaired or someone who speaks a different language, that number goes up to 93% of it being not identified or suboptimally managed. <clears throat> when we're actually looking here, you begin to see here that on this side, <clears throat> we're talking about how many people have pain, the number, it's almost all of them. And then when we look here, and that's age along the bottom, we begin to see the percentage of how, have, how many have multiple sites driving signals for pain that we're gonna expect behaviors from. <clears throat> so what does that mean um, then? It means that, that we're going to be having flashover unless we uh, use pain care at the exact same time as behavior care. They're one and the same, right? Um, and if our first thought is antipsychotics or sedatives or anti-anxiety medications or whatever, we need to actually switch that on its head and move to analgesic regimes that can actually help the individual. Um, and I know that BSO knows that, you know that really well. A little pearl to offer here is, in these type of individuals with these multiple pain sites, when we go to rule out, because it's hard to differentiate the beha behaviors that we call pain behaviors, or what people call in, in, on your side of the clinical um, um, team, responsive behaviors. They look exactly the same. So how do we tell the difference? Well, we assume pain until we rule it out. We do a test of analgesia. But the pearl that I wanna pass on is Tylenol isn't it. Tylenol works centrally, right? At the brain, but is for mild pain. And we have people with multiple pain sites screaming at flashover. Tylenol isn't going to blunt the signal enough to see a modulation in pain in the majority of people. And then what happens? If the Tylenol didn't work, we think that, that, that pain isn't the cause. And so now our plan gets skewed. And so it really needs to be the right medication and combination of medications to do a proper test of change to rule out pain. Uh, so that's just a little bit of a pearl that I wanted to pass along to you. Pain as a disease. So in these individuals, what we no longer have is a passive symptom. In our elderly living with chronic persistent pain, it's no longer a passive symptom. It is now a disease entity in its own right. And this is the emerging um, um, evidence. So what we have here now is all of that fight or flight that's been on 10, 20, 30 years from the autonomic system is gonna have multi-system consequences, including to all the communication pathways, all the communication pathways in our body. So over time, we start to see structural pathology to the pathway and the signal carrying becomes erratic or incredibly difficult to quiet and smooth out, which is the role of an analgesic regime. So now we have an aberrant pain reporting pathway. It doesn't stop reporting. It's not misrepresenting. It's amplifying. Uh, and we need combination analgesics. One won't be able to help quiet that neural excitability of the pain pathway and pain, a neural matrix. This is a whole bunch of uh, chemicals that are being released. And a lot of them are the pro-inflammatory cytokines that um, are released um, and that cause tremendous damage throughout the body. So the frequency and the erratic nature of the firing is going to give us the intensity of the pain, you know, whether we're mild, moderate, or severe, whether you use numerical or four-point or a non-verbal um, uh, cognitively impaired um, assessment tool. 
we're going to get amplification of the emotional response to it. And we're going to get quite uh, a potent um, behavioral response that goes along with it. And in most of these individuals, um, they've kicked over in that flashover point to what we also call either hyperalgesia or allodynia. Hyperalgesia, things that shouldn't hurt, hurt, right? Um, uh, excuse me, hyperalgesia, things that should hurt, hurt terribly, they're horrifically amplified. Um, and, and allodynia, things that shouldn't hurt, hurt. Uh, and then we'll see the resistance to, you know, hugs, touch, turning, you know, bathing, all those sorts of things. And, it, and we've got a central sensitization. Here's a little bit of, of, a, of a breakup, some visual for you from all the text in my slides. This is a, a PET showing the activity of uh, the uh, pain signal. Um, when it reaches central level in the brain and it's being processed. And this is an arth arthritic, a rheumatoid arthritic flare in one hand of an individual. And it's highlighting in the yellow and the orange and the red, um, you know, the rapidity, the uptake um, of the chemicals, you know, that they use to capture the heat signature note um, and, and where we're going to get the driving of of the behaviors from, just thought that that was interesting. Put a mental note on what that looks like and let's compare that to people with mild uh, cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and here you can see the amyloid plaques that are themselves amplifying signals um, in, cause the red, you know, is hot amplified signals and somebody with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. And when you compare these to this, and if we had a top skull view, which I believe, um, I'm, I'm not too sure if I took that out, but if we looked at a pain signal from the top of your head down, it would look the same as what we're seeing there um, in the right representation of Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> so, they work together, they're not separate pathways. And when, and when we see this and we, we actually have amyloid packs, now you can also see where we're gonna get erratic signal processing in cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease as well. People often think that these illnesses aren't painful. They are. The ability to report it is different. And here's kind of a nicer image. This is also showing the brain processing a music signal. Now, that's nice for interest, but I'll add on to that is the fact that if we play music that someone doesn't like, their pain signals get amplified and they'll get they'll they'll be in more severe pain. <laughs> So that kind of fits in, you know, with, with a behavioral care plan, doesn't it? Of stimulation, um, uh, uh, sensory overstimulation, these sorts of things. So a little pearl is, you know, anything that we're playing needs to be something that the individual actually enjoys. So what's our pain care significance to uh, successful behavioral care then? Um, Pain care is a primary intersection with behavioral care. They're one and the same. They aren't separate. They can't be separate and they need to work in concert at the exact same time, particularly in people who have more challenge in reporting to us, where it falls on us and our clinical prowess, knowledge, skill, um, uh, in order to be able to read the body and the behaviors that are telling us where to look and how bad it is. Uh, and so uh, we talked a little bit about the, what's our differential, how are we gonna um, tell the difference between a pain signal um, or non-pain signal driven behavior? Well, we have to rule out pain first. And we already know that about 84 to 93% of it, it's, there's going to be a big component to behaviors from pain, from what we've looked at. When I think about the pieces approach, when you actually 
look at your the pieces approach, it's actually telling you about the pain pathway and the pain neuro neuro matrix and how it's processing that attention, cognition, emotional response, and behavioral response. Each of it matches this diagram um, that we walked through earlier. And so uh, when I see the physical aspect, I think about the um, uh, the site of, uh, of injury, the nociceptin. I think about it traveling up the spinal cord to the brain level. But I was in the, the, the physical, when I'm thinking about the cortical limbic striatal circuits, there's our intellectual and emotional, and then the downward modulation that either helps the pain feel less or amplified that drives the behavioral response is the capability and that chemical soup environment um, that then impacts our, our socialization. The two are, are so intimately married together. I'm not gonna cover this whole slide in the interest of time, but it's included in the PDF. And so all the areas of the brain that are impacted with dementias and Alzheimer's are all the same areas that, um, that are part of our pain uh, protective system. And it doesn't stop the reporting. It makes it more erratic and amplified in the pain experience. And so our emerging research now shows us that elderly people with neural degenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, right? That chronic pain actually causes um, Alzheimer's to progress more quickly. And we know that that's true in pretty much every um, illness trajectory. The downward spiral that happens because of the uh, pathological changes that's happening to the brain or to the, to the body and all of its systems because the chemicals um, that are being released are flooding the whole, whole uh, anatomy of our body. And so when we think about the behaviors, the underlying causes of behaviors as trying to get to the root of that to drive the care plan and the action, um, I would like to see pain bumped. <laughs> way, way up there um, at the top, <coughs> excuse me, of our ruling out. Because in the presence of pain, pain is our universal complicator. It worsens all coexisting medical conditions. It causes them to pro progress even more rapidly. That fight or flight states on, it becomes pathological and it starts damaging every body system. And we see immune system suppression. We see the development of diabetes. We see the development of heart disease, um, enteric complications, impaired sleep. The body cannot reach homeostasis and rebalance in impaired sleep. Never mind all of this information flooding um, that happens, you know, impacts our, our cognition and concentration as well. Of course, we can't sleep when the body's under threat. We're under attack. The body's not going to want to sleep. But all of that comes together in this soup that impacts cognition. So when you think about doing cognitive assessment and pain isn't managed, the results of your cognitive assessment are going to be skewed too. And that puts you at high risk of thinking that somebody it has dementias further progressed and perhaps it was, it would score um, if pain was optimally addressed for that particular individual. Never minding, you know, carrying on through here, we get a renal impairment we, in the presence of pain. And, you know, I'm not going to go into all of this, but um, loved, I love explaining this slide when we have more time. So ultimately, uh, when we have musculoskeletal and organ-based pain, that's our nociceptive, nociceptive pain. Mixed with neuropathic-based pain, that's peripheral, um, as, as well as, you know, could be spinal or central if we've got tumors or compression or those sorts of things. Um, and then we have the emotional response and suffering and hopelessness and um, stop telling people that we hurt because nobody's been able to help me anyways. 
Um, and this is not my wording. This is the wording that I hear from hundreds of people I, that I consult on is they're in hell with the pain that they're experiencing. So pain care is significant to successful behavioral care. They're inseparable and with good reason. Um, it's anatomical, it's autonomic nervous system, um, and we uh, need the behavior to tell us um, about our whole pain assessment. Um, and so we can move to action and address it quickly and effectively. Uh, that's really, you know, the takeaway message here. We depend on it. We cannot separate it. It can't be separated anatomically. And so people don't complain about pain to get attention. They just don't. And what they've learned is that any complaining because they've been hurting so long and, it, and, and relief isn't coming ends up with a negative response. This is you know, where I love hearing how you guys constantly teach mentor and coach about no normalizing, no normalizing. When you think keeping your mind about their system is on fire with pain signals. And so we need to address pain because any attempts at doing behavioral care and modulation can't help until the pain signals quieted. And so pain care is key to successful behavioral care plans without any doubt. And so when we know and we think about it and we have empathetic, compassionate um, uh, cognition on our parts, we connect and we do and we move to action. And there's always so much more and so much more that I would love to share and talk about and go deeper with you. But I think that that's our time to get today. I've talked for 40 minutes and that's remarkable that I brought it in under time because usually I run out of time, um, but I, I wanna hear, have some interaction. I didn't bring a case study today because sometimes I do do that, um, but I was afraid I was gonna run out of time and here I didn't, so. How will you practice differently tomorrow um, in your identification of the underlying causes of behavior, how you're screening and assessing, how you're ruling out pain? And are you bumping it to the top of your list? That's great. And then that's it. Thanks, Tracy. You're welcome. Uh, wonderful presentation. We have a number of questions which I'm going to pose and that will kind of constitute our, our, our discussion. So the first question was from, from Jeff, who asks, uh, simply seeing the person, um, you talked about that potentially reigniting automatic responses. Does literature support the notion uh, of neuroplasticity? So mm. that when um, a pathway is reignited, does it light up certain things? And does this uh, kind of amplify any potential response? Um, and how does it explain a, like kind of chronic pain versus acute pain in some way? Just kind of wanting to little, know a little bit more about that. Great question. Absolutely. So when we're looking at pain as a disease, absolutely neuroplasticity comes into focus. And what we find is, is that alteration in neuroplasticity is, is pivotal from a pathological standpoint into central sensitization, right? Where, where we have the allodynia and hypo, uh, 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 excuse me, the allodynia and the hyperalgesia aspects of the pain presentation. Um, and so the full extent of plasticity isn't understood yet, but we certainly know that it's not a good thing in the pain world, <laughs> the alteration in the neuroplasticity of an individual. And what we do understand is it makes the pain um, severity um, and the pa uh, worse in the perception and the response of behaviors. There was a second part to that, Jordan, to that question. Yes. Um... Oh, the acute and chronic part, the acute and chronic. Yeah. So when we talk about neuroplasticity alterations, we're usually talking about chronic progressive or chronic persistent 
disease that's altering neuroplasticity, right? We're not talking about an acute scenario that heals and the pain goes away. Great, thank you for that. Um, Heather just had a comment just to say that um, she felt that this was really helpful as sort of as practice pearls um, and that thank you for sharing with it uh, with that oh, thank you Great. thanks Heather um, Marilyn is asking about if you could comment on the slide about showing people at their age uh, and the pain and types of pain increasing can you elaborate mm -hmm. on the reasons why those in their 90s have the highest types of pain uh, yeah. among older adults Beautiful question. So when we think about the areas that we're concerned, the greatest in is, is, is in that chronic persistent pain type. So what we're talking about is um, chronic progressive advancing illness. So over time, we have, you know, our newly diagnosed, we go into a chronic stage that chronicity will progress to um, uh, varying stages in, in the the chronic management aspect, then we go to advanced end stage disease and then end of life, right? Stages. So all the way along there, the destruction is advancing, right? Um, and that's what's causing us to die at the end of the journey. The body succumbs to that. So pain being our warning system that something's wrong as we see illness progression uh, and uh, and deterioration of the body um, and sites that drive pain, then that will correlate to the time for some of us in age, right? That's not to say that some people's bodies aren't horribly frail at 30 um, and, and some are really spry still at 90. But on average with age comes the more advanced stages of illness and more pain signals because more tissue damage, more destruction, and also the pathological alteration of our pain pathway and neuromatrix signaling process. So let's think about some of the diagnoses that you see for an individual. This is the kind of thing that, that I see almost in every instance when I consult into long-term care. I see that somebody has heart disease, they usually have diabetes. So we've got nerve-based pain. We have heart disease. We may have peripheral vascular disease or peripheral artery disease. Vascular pain is very, very excruciating. It's like an ischemic pain happening in the limbs. We have diabetes. So we have nerve-based pain. We have osteoarthritis. So even though it's not inflammatory, the pain signals moving release inflammatory cytokines. So we, we don't get the same kind of joint destruction that we get in rheumatoid arthritis, but we're still getting the pain signals. It's bone pain. Bone pain hurts pretty bad and connective tissue destruction. If you got it in our hands or wrists or elbows or shoulders or neck or spine, um, and then we have the osteoporotic or degenerative spine stuff happening. We've got nerve root compression, right? So we have heart disease when the kidneys aren't happy, then right goes together. And then now we also have, uh, you know, a typical or atypical dementias, right? Uh, and we layer all that together. Multiple pain sites from organs, musculoskeletal, peripheral nerves, uh, and nerve root compression right at the spinal cord. Youch, there's the flashover. Hope that helped answer that. Yes, thank you. Um, in the chat box, we also have a question um, from Nancy. And she said, why are doctors reluctant to provide stronger pain medication? Mm. Um, in particular, she just gave an example of, she's only seen one um, uh, <laughs> situation where they, doctor ordered Tylenol for pain um, as more of a routine kind of um, management of pain. So could, I mean, you can't speak on behalf of doctors, but no. what your clinical practice do you, do you notice in terms yeah, of yeah. as a yeah. Exactly. I have a lot of empathy for physicians. Like I have a lot of empathy for all of us in healthcare. Um, and, you know, 
physicians aren't trained to be pain specialists. They're given very, very little information. You know, vets get seven times more training in pain care than human physicians do. Interesting, isn't it? Nurses get three times more pain training than physicians do. And they're looking at a lot of things. It takes a team to manage pain well. And we're seeing more and more training and, and, and to try and combat some of the concerns around prescribing. But most of the fear around prescribing is generated by opioids, the idea of opioid use, right? Um, because you know we're constantly inundated with messaging that opioids are dangerous and kill. And they do in overdose situations, but that's not what we're prescribing. We're not prescribing overdose levels, quite the opposite. And our body's releasing opioids anyways. That's the endogenous opioid system that is trying to neuromodulate the descending pathway of the, so the person's on opioids anyways. All we're doing is supplementing that opioid. We start low, we go slow. But then the people are also trained around the idea that opioids will stop people breathing. Well, that's true in overdose situations. But if it was so hard-based evidence, then why would we use opioids like morphine or hydromorphone for somebody who can't breathe? See, there's a disconnect there somewhere because that is what we do. That's our first line in shortness of breath and with chronic illness right? Somebody with COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, we use opioids. So there's fear-based, that's the myth that comes in there. And then you also have to deal with the individual and the Tracy, you've um, frozen again. I'm wondering, hopefully it'll catch up the, the linkage. Um, it looks like she just disconnected. Um, we'll wait for her to reconnect. There we go. Hi, Tracy. We had a little connectivity problem. Yeah, I got booted. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yes. Just, yeah, absolutely. Let's pick up where I left off. So, uh, it's not just one-sided. It's not just physician-based. Um, and then a physician feels more confident when the information that they're getting from the team is a high level of identification assessment um, screening uh, to, to, to drive the confidence that I'm just going to stop her video and leave her audio on. Okay. But it looks like she's frozen again. Yeah, um, Tracy, well, maybe um, I'll just add a note uh, to her, but what we'll do, folks, is uh, if we're not able to resolve the connectivity issues in the next minute or two, um, we will share the questions with Tracy. Um, if you want to put your contact information into the chat, then we can share those questions with her. Um, and we can follow up with her and, and get you um, some of that uh, information afterwards. Okay. We're approaching the, the We're hour of three o'clock when everybody gets on the traffic highway of the internet and things get a little boggy. That's uh, all right. We were just yeah. saying, Tracy, that um, uh, what we'll do is we'll email um, the rest of the questions to you. And if people want to put in their contact information, um, particularly I see Allison and Jeff um, uh, and Irene, we still haven't gotten to your questions um, then we can answer your questions directly. Um, and in the meantime, um, I just wanted to, in the last five minutes, um, thank Tracy. So, so, so <laughs> see, there we go, Tracy. When it rains, it pours kind of thing um, for, for coming and presenting to us today, despite the connectivity challenges. And um, just like the the engagement from from everyone is that is such that I, I feel like this readily resonated with the group. Um, I am going to quickly just do some housekeeping at the end. Um, if if people want uh, uh, to have a certificate of attendance, 
please do um, complete the uh, um, uh, evaluation form that is going to be uh, sent to you uh, and put in your um, email into the evaluation form and you will get that certificate of attendance. And just to let you know that again, these um, sessions are recorded and will be posted on both the CLRI and the BSO website. So if those people in your teams that you think would benefit from seeing this presentation but weren't able to come today, you can share uh, uh, with the link with them uh, when it gets posted. Thank you so much, everyone. And I see everyone is completing the mini evaluation. That's wonderful. Um, and again, if you want to complete the emailed, uh, uh, more detailed evaluation, which just takes a one or two minutes, um, you can get that certification afterwards. Thank you so much to everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you so much to Tracy as well. Thank and, you so uh, much for having me. <laughs> uh, hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of your day and please join us next time uh, next month for our, our next rounds in in September. Take care. Bye everyone. Do you want to do a quick debrief Jordan? Uh, we'll just um, I think Agnes, you may um, you may be still recording. So Agnes, it's okay if we